We're talking about building a resilient life, and we've been looking at some significant themes about how to do that. For example, just simply the decision to not quit it allows options and possibilities that didn't exist before. Getting a big picture of what your life is rather than the small snapshot of the specific trial or challenge you're going through. Or going back and repairing the past so that it no longer acts as a hindrance towards your capacity to move forward because the resilient life is not about going bouncing back. It's about being able to move forward no matter what you've been through. God wants us to be able to do that. Today we're going to talk about how friends help us build a resilient life. And we're looking at three passages of Scripture this morning. The first is Mark. It said that Jesus appointed the twelve that they might be with him. I would just underline that phrase. The first thing he wants them to be is with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. In John chapter 13, Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. The world will know that we belong to Jesus, not by a dress code or the shape and style of a facility that we worship in. The world knows that we belong to Jesus and follow him by our relationships and our friendships with others. And then John 15, it says, I no longer call you servants because... A servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. So today we're going to talk about how friends can help you build a resilient life. There seems to be, despite the ease of connection with technology, an epidemic of loneliness. Even though we seem to be able to connect with more people, we feel less known and we feel like we know others less. And so it's easy to, take, um, to pursue substitutes for relationships and friendships. For example, it is actually easier to learn how to control other people than it is to develop relationships with them. Now, you're probably sitting here this morning and going, oh, I know some people like that, but that's not me. I would never try to control everyone. Well, some people try to control others through by, by being very loud and demanding and, and uh, domineering, and they just kind of impose their will by reason of their uh, just the force they bring to things. That's not the only way to control. Sometimes we can try to control through approval, whether by giving it or withholding it. And this is not something we so much recognize when we're doing it, but we get a real sense of it when it's being done to us. And so approval is withheld because someone wants us to do something or doesn't want us to do something. And then crises. We can actually learn to control others by creating crises. If the problem is big enough, then other people have to respond. We dig a really big hole, and they come and help us fill it. And so there's always this challenge to settle for those substitutes to authentic friendship and relationship. And I have to tell you that authentic friendships take time, and it's challenging. These are not easy things to do. We're created for it, but we seem to have difficulty with it. So a lot of people think, well, if I just met more people, the answer might not be meeting more people. The answer might be recognizing the people that God has already placed in your life. Now, there are some things that I cannot learn and cannot become without friends in my life. That's not just a Pastor Bob opinion. That's a biblical understanding. It's a spiritual truth. Isolated Christianity is an oxymoron. We're always called to community. We're always called to relationship. And it's true you can't know everyone. It's also true that you can know someone. So God calls us to this. The number one reason people give for not being able to develop more friendships is they just don't have enough time. And so it's very easy for us. There's a difference between filling our days and filling our lives. And the easier thing is to fill our days. We can cram them and jam them packed full of responsibilities and tasks. And yet, we will always feel somewhat empty. There are all kinds of walls that we can actually build that keep people at a distance, too. Some of these walls are not obvious. For example, some people can use humor as a way to create distance between them and other people. 
When the topic gets a little bit intimate or a little bit personal, sometimes a one-line wisecrack will keep people at a distance and they won't ask the follow-up question. Or, in our culture, you can use politics to create distance. All you have to do is name any political party or any political candidate, and instantly people start separating and dividing. We can even use theology to create distance and build walls. Even though 90% of scripture is agreed upon by almost everyone who follows Christ, a lot of times organizations will focus on the 5 or 10% that they're not in complete agreement on and use that as, a, as an excuse to create distance. And what God wants us to know is that's an unworthy pursuit. Remember, this is how people will know that we are followers of Jesus because we have love for one another. So we tend to be a little wary of building friendships, and there's reasons for that. We're afraid of being hurt, and the reason we're afraid of being hurt is because we have been. I would dare say every person in this room has been hurt by someone that you considered a friend. They said something or did something that significantly caused you pain. And there's also a fear of being embarrassed. We don't want people to get too close to see the cracks and the fractures and the inconsistencies. If they notice too much, too deep, then they'll see that the surface and the interior life seem to be a little bit different. And that's embarrassing to us, and we want to keep them at a distance. And then there's the fear of being challenged, because being called out is not the same thing as being called up. And we're afraid if someone tries to call us up, we will feel put down. And so we'll, our, our definition of friendship in our modern culture is someone who accepts me just the way I am. And what I would tell you is that's an incomplete definition. The goal of friendship is to accept people as they are, but to always hope for more than that. And there's ways that we can speak and invest into each other's lives that call for the best from us. The truth is, is that we are a broken people living with broken people in a broken world. What is the likelihood that friendships are going to go well all the time? The, the question is, why don't friendships uh, work more? Uh, the, the question is, why do any of them work at all? As broken as we are, as difficult as our world is, that's the challenge that we're facing. So the idea is, if I had better people, then I could have better friends. So let me just ask you a, a, a question to think about that. When you think about God, why would he want a relationship with us? He is perfect. We are not. He is faithful. We are not. Yet he is relentless in pursuing relationship with us. Why would he do that? If you always have to have someone better in order to pursue a relationship, why would he want a relationship with us? And it's because he values relationship. He understands that it is spiritual, it is significant, and it's something that we need to devote significant time to. Scripture reveals that friendship is actually part of God's plan for our lives. Friendship is part of God's plan for our lives. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture. I'm going to start with a verse that very few people have heard. And uh, it's followed by a verse that most of you have heard if you've been to very many weddings. I didn't put it in your notes, but it'll be on the screen. It says, there was a man, and what's the next two words? All alone. There was a man all alone. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and said, that sounds good to me. Oh, just for a little alone time, all right? Well, let's see how it goes for this guy. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, because when you are all alone, you have to work harder. That's true. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. When you're all alone, you're never truly satisfied. Also true. And here's the part we do know. Um, or, for whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Now you see why this passage never gets preached on. Right? <laughs> Just don't want to go there. Two are better than one. Because they have good return for their labor. If either of them falls, one can help the other up. But pity the, anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. 
a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This passage tells us the value of connection, of community, of relationship, of friendship. Friendship is part of God's plan, so here's some things that we need to know. We tend to hear God better in friendship than in isolation. Now, that's counterintuitive to us because most of us have heard illustrations from Scripture where Moses goes off by himself or Jesus goes off by himself, and that's when they kind of get clarity on who they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to do. And certainly there are times when we do need some one-on-one -on -one time with God, but it's also true that we tend to hear God better in friendship than in isolation. In fact, there's a whole series of spiritual gifts that are devoted exactly to that. So that when we gather, we can speak into each other's lives in a way that helps us understand more who God has called us to be and what he's called us to do. We spent quite a few weeks talking about a man by the name of David who was the second king of Israel. He's a fascinating guy. And when he got a start to say that his brothers approved of his efforts for leadership would be a complete overstatement. Actually, they put him down and they were rather diminutive in their commentary to him. When they talked to him, they, they put him down a lot. And uh, David was uh, such a, a, a talented and gifted individual that even the king of Israel became very insecure around him and decided he wanted him dead. And he didn't just make this a personal ambition. He actually used the power of the government and its military in order to try to carry it out. So he pursued killing David. And it got so bad that even David's brothers and family were no longer safe living at home because King Saul's incensed hatred against David was spilling out. And they had to leave their own home. They had to go be where David was because that was the only safe place. When they got there, they discovered that David had grown up a lot, but they also discovered that he had formed a community of misfits, people that the world thought were useless, and in fact, he was building this band of brothers that were making a real difference in the, in the area that they lived in. And they saw their brother in a completely new light. They saw his leadership capacity, they saw his skills, they saw his intellect, they saw his discernment, they saw his wisdom. And because they saw him differently, they acted differently towards him. And David actually wrote a song about this experience. And, and the song starts like this. How good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. That's the, how he, that's the song that he started writing. How good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in, in unity. And then he wants, because he's a poet... He wants to give an illustration or a metaphor to help us understand and see more clearly what this is. And so what he says is, it is like, and then he starts spanning through his life to try to find an example of what this is like to help people understand it. And he found it. It is like when oil is poured on your head and it goes down your hair and your beard and down your clothing. Now, that had only happened one time in David's life. And it was when he was, as a young boy, called out of the fields where he was tending sheep, and he stood before the prophet Samuel, who took out a horn of oil and poured it on him and declared to him who God had called him to be and what God had called him to do, and that he would eventually be the second king of Israel. Now, why is that so significant? This is what David is saying. That when I am in unity with my brothers, when I have that kind of relationship, I get as much prophetic insight from that relationship as I do from a prophet standing in front of me, anointing me with oil, and declaring what God has called me to do. That's how valuable friendships are. So we tend to hear God better in friendship than in isolation. We also gain a wider perspective about ourselves and our world. We all have blind spots. We all have limited vision and limited wisdom, limited understanding. So God calls people into our life to help widen out our view and give us a more fully orbed perspective in life. We can also be encouraged. When friendship is, is engaged in your life, you can be encouraged by others. If, if we didn't have people pouring courage in, many or most of our decisions would be dominated by fear. The idea of, of encourage comes from two words, to pour in and courage. Someone comes alongside of you and they give you words that give you the willingness to try, even when you're afraid. And so this is a very powerful experience for people to go through, that you can be encouraged. And we're challenged to become better and more than we are today. 
A friend can spot some potential in us, and they can see some opportunities around us, and they will challenge us to set aside the excuses that we come up with and to actually lean into something that God has created us to be or called us to do. And the truth is we can also accomplish more together. One person can only accomplish so much by themselves. Two people by themselves can accomplish twice as much, but two people working together can accomplish more than twice as much. It's the synergistic thing that God has built into the human condition. And we can actually do more together than we can alone. So God does a lot of his work through our relationships and through our friendships. Jesus himself did a lot of his work through relationship and friendship. He didn't just ask his disciples to show up on a certain time, uh, certain days of the week, so he would give them their instruction and then they would go and, and try to remember it. Jesus said he called them to be with him. And in those days, they didn't have air-conditioned automobiles to, to drive around in. So when they would travel, they were traveling on roads in a part of the country, a part of the world that's incredibly hot and humid and difficult travel. And the nights can be very cold and the food isn't always good. And, and, and you get aches and pains from the physical toil that your body is experiencing. And there are circumstances that they would run into where people would reject them. Sometimes they even wanted to kill Jesus, so they would accuse him of horrible things. And all of these people were together. And here's what I want you to know. The kinds of conversations you have when you're going through difficult times together are much deeper than conversations you have when everything is wonderful. They talked about things that mattered. And it made a difference in their lives. Now, here's what I also want you to see is is if you're looking for friendships, don't look for people who are just like you. You can't actually become more by looking for the same. Look for people that are different from you. People that are different from you. Look, look at the disciples of Jesus. They were very different from each other. Peter is the second disciple of Jesus. His, his brother, Andrew, is the one who helped bring him to Christ. But Peter's the second disciple of Jesus, and he is the first duh disciple. He's just the duh guy. He's loud. He's proud. My favorite passage of scripture about Peter is on the Mount of Transfiguration. It says, Peter did not know what to say, so he said. That's Peter. All right? Just put his foot in his mouth and run as loud and fast as he can. And then there's James and John, whose nicknames were the Sons of Thunder. How do you think they got that name? Those guys didn't sneak up on anybody. They were loud everywhere they went. Thomas was known as, he's known as Doubting Thomas. He struggled with needing more evidence. He was incredibly gifted at bringing people to Jesus, but not until he figured some things out. And so that was something he just had to work through at an intellectual level. How about Matthew? Matthew was a tax collector. He was despised by everyone. How would you like to develop a personal friendship with an IRS government agent? <laughs> Probably not so much. They're very different. But you cannot become more by looking for the same. It's amazing how many people we just check off the friendship list because they're so different from us. And you could be throwing away one of the most powerful influences and deepest friendships you've ever known. Some friendships are seasonal. You know, I wish I could tell you that all friendships last a lifetime. Most of them don't. Lifetime friendships are rare, and they should be treasured. And you can't tell when you're developing a relationship if this is going to be a lifetime or a seasonal relationship. And sometimes when people relocate or vocation calls them out of an area or, or they get married and they become part of a family and, and, and go to a different place, a lot of times we get frustrated because we feel like we've lost a friend. I think it would be helpful for us to recognize that that was a wonderful gift that God gave us in that season of our life. And if God gave us that gift in that season, he also has gifts to give us in this season. We just need to open our eyes. Friendship is as important to your spirituality as prayer and fasting is. It really is. God takes common things and reveals spiritual things in them. He takes ordinary things and makes them extraordinary. He takes something as common as water and through baptism shows us how we can burst into the kingdom of God. He takes something as common as bread and wine and shows us how we can develop an intimate connection with Jesus, and personally, deeply remember the incredible things that he's done for us. Friendship is common 
and yet it's extraordinary. It's often friendships that actually helps us to survive hostile circumstances, things that we would give up on and go back away from. And the fact that we have people who are supportive of us helps keeping us moving forward. Most people in your life will never see deeper than the surface that you show them. And that's never enough for any of us. We all long for something deeper and more. We want to be known more by someone, and we want to know others more. So what a, a, a person might do some really good things on their own or some wonderful things on their own, but it's really hard to persevere on your own. We need people around us to keep us moving forward. Now here's what I will tell you. It's unwise to expect one person to do all these things. It's just too much. This happens a lot in marriage. Some people, when they get married, they assume that their spouse is going to be everything for them. That does not work. There's only one person who can be everything to us, and that's God. And you probably have already figured out now that you did not marry God. <laughs> Maybe you thought you were marrying God, but it didn't take long for some of the deity to slip just a little bit. So different people play different roles in our life. So here's some questions to help identify what some of those roles are. For example, who coaches you? See, there are people who will do things for you, but then there are other people, and they will invest in you in a way that allows you to be able to do something eventually you can't do now. God brings coaches and mentors into our life. All through Scripture, you see this over and over again. And it's not just about doing something for the coach or the mentor. It's about being trained so that even after the coach or the mentor is no longer present, you are now able to do something you couldn't do before. It's very powerful. Or who stretches you? Who expands your thinking? Who exposes you to new ideas? Who challenges your viewpoints? Who's the, who are the people who will recommend articles or podcasts or blogs or books to help you see things a little more deeply or a little more widely? Who, who can help us increase our understanding of ourselves or of the world we live in? And then who encourages your dreams? Uh, they're not delusional. They're not the kind of people who just say, oh, you can be anything you want, or you can do anything you want. That's actually not true, and it's not in Scripture. You can be what God has called you and created you to be. And so when you talk about your dreams and your visions, sometimes they, they, that resonates with them about what's true about that vision and you, what's true about that dream and you. And they pour courage in. They, they encourage us to move forward in the pursuit of that. Or who protects you? Not just a physical protection, but if someone's saying something about you that's negative, do they stand up for you? Now, here's a challenging thing. Sometimes we just want someone to always argue that we're better than we are. And that's not what a friend does. A friend wants the truth to be spoken. The truth is, is that we've all made mistakes. It's also true that we don't want to be defined by them. A friend doesn't say, no, that was never true of them. A friend might say, that did happen, and it broke their heart and some things in their lives. And more than anything, that's not what they want to be true about them anymore. It's a way for sticking up for a person. It's a very powerful thing to have a person like that in your life. And then who cries with you? Who cries with you? We're pretty uncomfortable with tears in our culture. There's this great verse in the Bible that says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But modern Christianity looks more like rejoice with those who rejoice and tell those who are weeping to stop crying. Because <laughs> it makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? I mean, I promise you, some of the most awkward is just, just have someone walk up to you and then right in the middle of the conversation just break down with tears running down their face. And you will feel trapped. You will feel stuck. You will feel completely unprepared for this. And more than anything in the world, you will want to get out and, here's the, and why is that true? Because we think we're supposed to have something important to say or to be able to fix the problem for them. And sometimes we just need someone who will help bear the burden for a minute. So, crying is not the same thing as complaining. Finding someone who can complain with you is not a benefit, and they may not be your friend. The, our world is filled full of complainers. This is the age of rage kind of ranting that goes on is absolutely unbelievable. I'm not talking about someone taking your side and going on a rant with you. I'm talking about someone who, when they see what causes you pain, they sense it and they feel it too. 
and their heart is broken for you, and their eyes well up in tears because they know what you're going through. And then who corrects you for your good? Because uh, there are people who will correct you because you embarrassed them. That's not the same thing. Some of the worst correction I've ever seen from parents in public places is when the parent was embarrassed by what their child did. And so they just kind of overreact in the moment. And that does not help the child, and it doesn't really help the parent either. But when correction is for us to actually get better, for our benefit, that's very powerful input into our lives. And it's very helpful for us to hear it and to have someone who can do that. It's very powerful. And then who seeks God with you? I did not say who seeks God for you. It's one thing to pray for someone. It's another thing to pray with someone. And this is a difficult thing for us to learn. And in my experience, men in particular struggle more with this than women. That's not a universal truth, but it is something that's generally true. And I think it's because we assume that prayer has to sound religious. And if it doesn't sound religious enough, it's like, it's like God is up in heaven and there's all this noise going on on planet Earth. And he's hearing all this noise. And then there's something that sounds religious. And he goes, oh, they're talking to me. That, that's not how it actually works. Our prayers are not effective because they sound religious. Our prayers are effective because they sound honest. Wouldn't it be great if while you were having a conversation with God, someone was coming around the corner and they couldn't tell who you were talking to until they came around the corner and they figured out it was God? By the way, husbands and wives often have difficulty praying together. They feel awkward about that. And uh, a lot of times it's because one assumes that the other is more spiritual, and so they want them to carry the responsibility. And I would just encourage you, it's honest conversations. They don't have to be long. Don't set a timer. I mean, who does that with any other conversation, right? Do you go home after church today and look at your spouse and say, okay, we've committed to 15 minutes talking together. Go. <laughs> say something. Just Don't just stand there. No, nobody does that. Uh, in conversations that I have with my wife, some of them are only a couple minutes long and some of them can be hours long. And our conversations with God can be like that too. So who seeks God with you? Now, what I can tell you is that we've got life groups that will relaunch in, uh, in the last week of September this year. Just maybe start thinking about that now. Remember, we can fill our days, but that's not the same thing as filling our lives. And maybe you can start thinking about that now that when that season rolls around, you want to make sure you have some time for that. I think that's really helpful. I'm going to tell you about the best friend you'll ever have, and I'm going to tell you what it doesn't mean and what it does mean. The best friend you'll ever have is Jesus. And I know that because of the kind of friend he was to those 12 guys that he called to be with him. Every single one of them abandoned him when he needed them the most. Every single one of them walked away from him. And the duh cycle was the worst of the lot. Only hours before, he was declaring how brave and incredibly strong his faith was and that he would never let Jesus down. And then under the interrogation of a servant girl, which is about as unintimidating a conversation as you will ever have, he denies Jesus three times. And Jesus goes through the crucifixion and resurrection and comes back to that group of people. And he didn't say this. Now I know what you're made of. Now I know who you really are. Now I know what you're really like. You are out of my life forever. He didn't do that with a single one of them. He has personal conversations. And he has group conversations to reinforce and reaffirm his love for them and to call them into the capacity of being all that God intended for them. Now, let me tell you what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that the only friendship you need is God. If I've got God as a friend, I don't need anybody else. That's not biblical and it's not true. God didn't say he would be a forever friend of yours so that you wouldn't need any other friends. He said, no matter what you have done or haven't done, no matter what you have said or haven't said, I will not forsake you. That's his friendship. But it's not to eliminate 
other friendships. It's actually, this is the second part, to help us develop other friendships. Because when you feel secure in your relationship with God, it enables you to risk other relationships. Because if they don't approve, that will be painful. But you have a loving Heavenly Father who does approve of you. If they abandon you, that will hurt. But you have a loving Heavenly Father who will never abandon you. If they won't forgive you, that will be difficult, but you have a loving Heavenly Father who will never fail to forgive you. You see, it's the relationship that we have with God that helps us have relationships with others. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, the, the truth is, is that we often struggle when it comes to relationships, and we're not sure we have what we need to offer. We're apprehensive about someone else's intentions towards us. We're very fearful. And we're not the most patient people in the world either. We want our friendships to be instant and deep and long-lasting. And your word indicates that it takes time and that that too is a gift from you. And that if we're willing to trust you and extend our lives and expand our gaze to include others in our lives, that that's when we experience the kind of richness that flows from community and the power that you intended for our lives. Father, help us know today that the goal is, is not to find one person that fulfills all these things in us, but to appreciate and value those who fill some of those roles in our lives and to make sure we have time for them. We thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.